Daryl Brooks. Two completely different litigants in two completely different cases. However, when examined a little more closely, their similarities begin to expose themselves with their manipulative tactics, their abusive allegations towards their significant others, the need to put vindication before their own defense strategies. As we slowly lift the veil of these two wolves in sheep's clothing, the more sickening and vile the image becomes. Take a walk with me. Let me show you a little bit of what I mean. As we explore Amber Heard versus Gil Brooks. The term crocodile tears was originally derived from ancient Egyptians. The crocodile was highly respected in Egyptian culture, so much so that the underwater god of crocodiles, Sobek, is often portrayed either in its human form with a crocodile head or even as just a crocodile by itself. The term became commonplace under the assumption that such a well-respected beast would, like any other animal, need to attack and consume others to stay alive, but also would publicly lament for their prey like any other caring or considerate individual who respects life like humankind would. Bogorad Syndrome was often named after this oxymoronic fable, coined for the condition's contradictory effects, which cause sufferers to cry while eating. Today's crocodiles do indeed have tear ducts, much like the modern-day crocodile, who actually will weep when out of the water for extended periods of time to keep their eyes lubricated and moist. However, unlike the fables of old, have not been found to be crying while attacking prey, likely due to their primary hunting grounds being found in bodies of water. We're going to take a look at a few clips from today's subject's respective trials, thought to be prime examples of this adverse phenomenon. I'll be pausing along the way to offer commentary, as is this channel's modus operandi. First, we'll take a look at a couple of specific portions of Amber Heard's testimony that sparked debate around the nation for its questionable authenticity. Following that, we'll take a look at Daryl Brooks' opening statement, which was almost exclusively heralded around the world as almost but certainly disingenuine. At the end, we'll examine how these two compare as actors, and whether or not their public displays of emotions were indeed genuine, or were televised examples of crocodile tears. Let's just jump on into it, shall we? I, I tried to, you know, he would make these comments about, you know, whoring myself out, but do so in the context of me acting. You know, and he would talk about other actresses who do my role in this way where they were worthless whores, that they were, they were, you know, uh, uh, fame hungry, you know, expletive, expletive, you know, just this, the point is it felt really dirty to be an actor. It, never mind that he was one. It was more, it was dirty that I wanted to do this job that I wanted to do and I was doing the job of an actress. I find a lot of Amber's testimony hard to believe. I'm not saying she's lying because we'll never know for sure either way, but I think there are times when she is being genuine and you can kind of feel that, and there are other times when she's not and you can like really feel that. It's not necessarily a tangible feeling, it's almost like on an instinctual level you can just like sense something isn't right. Like that feeling in, in your gut you get when things just don't seem right and you feel like you should leave. They call that the sixth sense, and, and you got to listen to that, but it, it could literally save your life one day. Regardless, though, we hear Amber talk about the times Johnny has shamed her for, like, what she was wearing and, and slut-shaming her, and I can a thousand percent believe that he would feel that way. I mean, he's a lot older than her. 
she has to be one of the most beautiful women in the world. I mean, as, as much as she is a, a toxic person, she is gorgeous. But we hear snippets of Johnny in the recordings actually, like, kind of throwing out some of these jealous sentiments. He'll, like, call her a whore. Again, he'll, he'll slut-shame her. She'll tell him to go suck his dick, and he'll tell her, like, oh, no need, you, you already have, or, or something. Basically implying that she's already sucked somebody else's, somebody else's dick. It's really misogynistic and gross. I mean, I think it's pretty clear they were both really bad to each other in a lot of really toxic ways. Johnny was the one who initially lost the most, though. I mean, a lot of the abuse claims, I think, were untrue. But some of what Amber is claiming, I believe, did happen. Like I said, the the slut-shaming and the misogyny, I think. And you can kind of tell when she's telling the story that, like I said, that, that a little snippet in your brain kind of feels like, okay, maybe she is telling the truth here. This feels genuine. I know a lot of guys who are, who are like Johnny when they get really jealous of their girlfriends, like, Wearing skimpy outfits, like, I, I really don't get that. Like, don't you want your partner to look as good as she possibly can? I mean, it's essentially just as much a reflection on you as it is for her. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's a line where it goes from looking good to just, like, <laughs> advertising the goods, so to speak. Like, outfit, outfits that are more small pieces of cloth than actual clothes. But, I mean, I would want my partner to... For sure, like be, feel respected, no doubt. But I, I don't. I don't think anybody should be telling somebody else what they can and can't wear. That just feels gross to me. I feel like if if you're a healthy couple, you can communicate, and as a couple, your girlfriend would respect your boundaries and and kind of decide accordingly. Like at the end of the day, you can't control what someone else is gonna wear, but. If your partner values your opinion and wants you to feel comfortable when going out, she's going to make decisions accordingly, if that makes sense. Anyway, moving on. All my point was, was that when Amber is talking about Johnny being misogynistic and gross, like just now, I think she gets into it a little bit, when describing her wearing this dress out to this premiere or whatever, this feels genuine. Like, I just... My radar goes off, and it feels like she's telling a story that she remembers. Later on, when we get into the abuse allegations, I kind of stop feeling that way. Like My radar starts dinging that maybe there's some non-truthfulness going on here. But that's just me. Let's, all right, let's keep playing, and, and we can all decide for ourselves. Ready? It was everything I... Every time I was walking out of the house, I, he would ask me, that's really what you're wearing, kid? Oh, I see. You know, I, I wore a dress to an event once and I felt, I felt beautiful in it. <laughs> like, stupid as that sounds, I, I felt pretty in this dress I picked out and <sighs> I showed it him because I, you know, it's a carpet, it's red carpet, so it's like, you know, pu publicized and I kind of thought it was weird he didn't wasn't saying anything about it. You know, I left him to go do this red carpet. And I was like, did you see the, the, you know, the event I went to, you know, basically I just, I, I, I felt pretty and I thought like, did you see that? You know, I wanted him to say something about that, I guess. And, um, and he said, well, this is after he, Stopped talking to me for some time, didn't tell me why. When he came back into my life, he wouldn't explain why he was acting different. He just kind of acted mad at me, didn't know what I had done wrong. And when I brought up the dress and the event, because it was an event to support a charity I was really involved with at the time, and I said, you, you know, did you see that thing? And he said, yeah, yeah, I think the whole world saw that kid. That's how they'll remember you. That's how the world will remember you. And I was like, Oh, come on. I mean, it's like, but it, you know, I felt, I felt good in it. I felt good. And he said, yeah, kid, that's what you're putting out there in the world. No one will ever forget that. And that's all they'll see you as. That's what you, that's what you wanted. 
that's what you were going for. I guess I get like a little bit kind of what Johnny is saying here. I mean, it's it's clear he's been tainted by the by the seedy under, underbelly of Hollywood. Um, but I mean, he isn't just blatantly sex shaming her here. At least you know he's he's saying. Amber, if if you want respect and to be taken seriously, that you need to embody that twenty four seven. Like you need to present yourself in a respectful way. That put out what you want into the world, and somehow the world will find its way to get that for you. That that mentality and that mantra really can work. But also, like if she wants to look fucking pretty, like let your wife be pretty. She's made a career on being sexy. If you thought when marrying her that that was all of a sudden going to stop, that's a little diluted. But, I mean, I don't know. It's got to be hard to be these kind of people when you marry. They're all fucking psychos. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, what do you expect? Her to go to the red carpet in a pantsuit? Like, come on now. You know, my dress was slow cut. I get it. It's low cut. But I felt, um, you know... Uh, I felt really embarrassed and horrible that I wore that. I felt like, how could I have made that choice? Of course, you know, he's right. You know, you start to believe it. I, I started to believe that, that that made a lot of sense, of course. Um, but it didn't stop with that. It was just, it, it was clothing in general. And when I walked out of the house, it was never, it wasn't just like, hey, you're not allowed to wear that. It was like, oh, really? That's what you're wearing. No wonder. No wonder you get cast in those roles. No wonder you... you you, that's what you are. That's what you're making it. And it just, it, you know, it continued. And then, then there would be a blow up. And at first it was just to throw something, smash some things. Um, it loves to smash up a, a place, an apartment, furniture. That's what it started with. Um, glass, threw glass at me. And I remember it was summer. Um, and he just threw this glass across the kitchen and I, it didn't hit me, but I, I, it shattered behind me. And I remember thinking that it like very easily could have hit me and that calling me a whore. It didn't start with using the whore word. It was just comments, um, until it would escalate. And then I started to notice the pattern of escalation where he'd, throw glass or turn over a table. Then he would hit the wall and then he'd hit the wall really close to my head. You know, like when I'm standing there, you know, just hit the wall screaming at me. Um, but then he would um, disappear and get clean and sober and he'd come back and tell me that he, had, he was done drinking, he was over it, he was done, cleaned himself up, he had done it before and he'd do it again. And then he would go back to this like wonderful, like almost like just unreal, like but real, you know, but un unbelievably nice, sensitive, kind, warm, generous, interesting, funny man that I loved. And he would make me feel so loved. Like it would get, I would feel so distant from that thing. That was so scary that I would not even recognize the two. And that was how, you know, our relationship kind of started to develop in that first year. Jesus, if what she is saying is true, they were having these, like, toxic kind of blow-up arguments in their, she said in their first year. Wouldn't that be like a, like a major red flag? Like, hey, hey, oh, oh, over here, over here, maybe we aren't a good match. I mean... <laughs> We hear the way Amber would talk to him during these fights. It's it's just despicable, like real vile, cut you to the bone type comments that felt really judgmental and catty. I, I imagine that would be infuriating to deal with, let alone you know through the lens of somebody struggling through the pain of addiction like like Johnny. But I mean, we heard just there what I felt like were genuine sentiments, like when she's talking about how great Johnny is, and he's so generous, and blah, 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 blah. That, to me, feels genuine. But again, she's so hard to read him. She's not a great actress, but for all I know, this could all be lies, and it probably is. Do you remember the first time that he physically hit you? Yes. 
Please tell the jury about it. <laughs> it was so, it's seemingly so stupid, so in, like insignificant. I will never forget it. It changed, it changed my life. I, I was sitting on the couch and we were talking, we were having a, like a normal conversation, you know, just, there was no fighting, no argument, nothing. And um, he was drinking and um, I didn't realize at the time, but I think he was using cocaine because it was like there was a jar, a jar of cocaine out on the table. I, re I realize that sounds weird, but it's like a, a, an actual vintage jar of it. There's that judgmental tone again. I mean, she she clearly really has a lot of resentment about Johnny's drug use. She she really goes in hard throughout this trial to try and attack Johnny's character through his addiction. And like what she's not realizing is it's it's actually helping his case and, and not hers. We I mean, we knew he was an addict. He stood up there in the stand and admitted to it. And I think that was the big difference for, for a lot of us is that he was taking ownership over his unhealthy behaviors in the relationship and, and taking accountability for his disease, which, you know, in turn makes Amber look really judgmental and her not taking any accountability at all, basically accusing everybody of lying, really hurts her character. I mean, Amber was, was Johnny's wife, the person, theoretically, that you would trust most in this world and, and confide all your dark secrets in. The fact that she was putting his addiction struggles up for the whole world to see was like a real betrayal of that trust one would, would come to expect from a partner, I mean, let alone a wife, to, to not air out your dirty laundry, you know? I mean, she was she was taking pictures of him passed out all over the place. It, like, it legitimately made me really uncomfortable that she was doing that and just, just posting him up for everybody to see. She knew what she was doing. She was doing everything she could to rub his nose in it every chance she got. Just really nasty stuff. Totally backfired. It's just like Daryl when he's questioning Erica. Any benefit their testimony could have had is largely outweighed by the damage it's doing to their characters, trying to discredit their partners. They're both just just blinded by their own desires for vindication and, and sacrificing their own legal, legal defense at, 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 the co at, at their cost. You know, probably even at their respective attorney's acquiescence, you know, <laughs> they, they couldn't have thought that that was a good idea. But I didn't see him use it at the time, so I, I didn't really factor that in. I just, you know, he's drinking and we're talking and it's there's music playing and he's smoking cigarettes and we're sitting next to each other on the couch. And I ask him about the tattoo he has on his arm. And to me, it just looked like um, black marks. It, like, I didn't know, I didn't know what it said. It just looked like muddled, faded tattoo that was hard to read. And I said, what does it, what does it say? And he um, said, it says, why no, it says, why no? And I, um, I didn't see that. I thought he was joking uh, because it didn't look like it said that at all. And I laughed. It was that simple. Um, I, I just laughed because I thought he was joking and slapped me across the face and I laughed. I laughed because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought this must be a joke. This must be a joke because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him kind of laughing still thinking that he was going to start laughing too, to tell me it was a joke, but he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny. You think it's funny, bitch. You think you're a funny bitch. And he slapped me again. Like I was clear. It wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. Okay. So now we're finally getting into some of the abuse allegations. Um, Maybe now you can kind of see what I mean about lying and you can kind of tell. We haven't really gotten that far 
into her account yet and already those alarms are going off in my head that things just aren't quite right. Uh, moreover, Johnny's reaction, I think, is very telling. He kind of, like, raises his eyebrows, but then also immediately furrows them as if he's kind of startled by the last, like, you think you're a funny bitch. Here, I'll tell you what. I'm going to run it back so we can all take a look again. Make sure you watch Johnny as she describes the slap, and you can decide for yourself. And slap me across the face. And I laughed. I laughed because I, I didn't know what else to do. I thought, this must be a joke. This must be a joke. Because I'm, I didn't know what was going on. I just stared at him, kind of laughing still, thinking, that he was going to start laughing too to tell me it was a joke, but he didn't. He said, you think it's so funny. You think it's funny, bitch. You think you're a funny bitch. And he slapped me again. Like, it was clear it wasn't a joke anymore. And I stopped laughing, but I didn't know what else to do. You know, you... I, you, I didn't know what to do. You, you would think you, you would have a response, but I, as a woman, had never been hit like that. I'm an adult, and I'm sitting next to the man I love, and he slapped, he slapped me for no reason, it seemed like, and I missed the point. It was that stupid. Second slap, I know he's not kidding, but I don't know what else to say or do, so I just stared at him. I didn't say anything. I didn't react. I didn't move or freak out or defend myself or, or say, what are you doing? You're crazy. I just stared at him because I didn't know what else to do. And he slaps me one more time. Hard. I lose my balance. Um, at this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch, or I was on the edge of the couch. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you, I realized that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking. Because it didn't hurt. It didn't physically hurt me. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never, why I never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before. Wait a minute. Oh, hold on. I, I thought you just said you were sitting on the edge of the, on, on the, edge of the couch. I'm not, I'm not crazy, right? All right, let's, let's run that back. At this point, we're sitting next to each other at the, on the edge of the couch. Or I was on the edge of the couch. Yeah, that's right. I thought so. I knew I heard that. You liar! You, you lying sack of pants suit. And I'm all of a sudden realizing that the worst thing has just happened to me that could possibly happen to you, I realized that I, I wish so much he had said he was joking. Because it didn't hurt. It didn't physically hurt me. I was just sitting there on this, on, on this carpet, looking at the dirty carpet, wondering how I wound up on this carpet and why I was never, why I never noticed that the carpet was so filthy before and I just didn't know what else to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to react. I just, Sat there thinking, how much time do I have till I figure out what I need to do? Because, God, did he just hit me? No, I didn't want to leave him. I didn't want this to be the reality. I didn't want to have the man I was in love with. I know you don't come back from that. You know, I'm not dumb. I, I know you can't hit a woman. I, you can't hit a man. You can't hit anyone. Uh -huh. Careful now. <laughs> You want to walk that one back, Amber? <laughs> she caught herself. <laughs> and you can't just hit somebody because they... I knew there was no... I knew it was wrong, and I knew that I had to leave him. And that's what broke my heart. Because I didn't want to leave him. I thought if I got up out of that room, I'd leave the best thing that ever happened to me. 
And I wish I could sit here and say I stood up and I walked out of that house and I drew a line and I stood up for myself. But I was just looking at the dirty carpet trying to will myself to get up, to walk out of the door because I knew I needed to. And I really slowly, I stood up and I remember looking at him in the eye and just looking at him, frankly, because I didn't know what else to do. And before I know it, he starts crying. And you know, like I, I had never seen an adult man cry. Um, I didn't even really see my dad cry at my grandma's funeral. You know, it's just, it's weird. I'll take things I did not expect to come out of Amber Heard's testimony for a hundred, Alex. What is toxic masculinity? Like, what the fuck did she just say? <laughs> She's never seen a man cry? <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. Uh, like, is she trying to shame him? Like, uh, what? what's her point? So strange. And he's crying. Uh, tears, I mean, just falling out of his eyes. He gets down on his knees and he grabs my hands and he's touching my hands and he's saying to me, I will never do that again. I'm so sorry, baby. I, I put the fucker away. I thought I killed it and it's, it's done. I, 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 I thought I put the monster away and I've done it before. It's done. But on his knees. And I, 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 I didn't have words. I didn't know what to say. I just remember thinking that it was just, he was crying. He seems so sorry, but I knew I couldn't just forgive him because I, right? That, that means it will happen again, no? You know, like I've seen the health class videos like everyone else. And I got up in my car. I walked to the car. I didn't say anything. I made a point th to not say, oh, it's okay or anything like that. I just didn't say anything. I got up. I went to the car. I sat in my car and I felt like I sat there forever. I didn't want to turn the key. I just leaned my head up against the window. And I remember just seeing my breath on the on the windshield. Whoa, 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 whoa. What did she just say? Let me run that back. I went to the car, I sat in my car, and I felt like I sat there forever. I didn't want to turn the key. I just leaned my head up against the window. And I remember just seeing my breath on the on the windshield. I thought I heard that right. I mean, I don't know what kind of car she's in, but even if she's in a smart car, like the smallest car possible, you're not gonna see your breath on the windshield leaning your head against the driver's side mirror. Like, picture that for a second. Your head's against the window, you're crying. Uh, even with the defrosters on, you're not gonna see your breath on the windshield. They say that one of the key ways to tell if somebody's lying is inconsistencies. That is the number one thing they look for. That's why during interrogations, police will ask you what seemingly inane questions over and over again and ask you to repeat your story several times because they're looking for inconsistencies within your story so they can then confront you on those inconsistencies, proving that you're lying. This is twice now. Her testimony has made zero sense. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely, I haven't watched a lot of this trial, but I'm getting now why they're calling her out for this. This, <laughs> She is lying. Her pants are on fire. Just seeing my breath and trying to will myself to have the strength to know what I should do in this moment because I was heartbroken. And I sat there for a long time, and I eventually turned the key and drove home. And what did you do after that? I don't know. I, I don't remember what I did when I got home. I don't remember. Um, I went to my therapist. I told her. Objection hearsay. 
<laughs> Camille! Oh, my homegirl! She won't let her list on her laurels for a second! Man, <laughs> Camille Vasquez and Zach Wichow need to, like, go on a date or something because they are my fucking power couple of 2022. <laughs> uh, ruthless! Alright, <clears throat> so we looked at, um... One of the key moments from Amber's testimony, I think, uh, definitely, like I said, my radar really kind of flares up. I think that she is not nearly a good liar as Daryl Brooks is. I don't know if that's a, a good quality or not. I feel like that's almost a point for Amber, but, um, there was one more, uh, section of her testimony that I found really just strange. So it's not going to take long. It'll take a few minutes. I'm going to put that on, and then we'll look at uh, at Brooksy. So, all right, let's pop that on now. He had me by the neck, and he felt like he was on top of me. And I'm lo I, I'm looking at him in his eyes, and I don't see him anymore. I don't see him anymore. It wasn't him. It was black. I've never been. So scared of my life. It was, it was black. I couldn't see him, and he was looking at me. And I was trying to get through to him. I was trying to say to him in some way that it was me. I was trying to get through to Johnny, and I couldn't see him. I couldn't see him at all. Amber's ask rate before this trial, like post Aquaman two. They were asking for like four million dollars a picture. She is way overpaid. I mean, god damn. She's a terrible actress. This is fucking oof. I mean the cry voice is just so cringe. Like, what are you doing, lady? <laughs> Got her hair up all old lady style too to like make her look wholesome. Like, this is an epic fail in all proportions. It's brutal. I think my biggest takeaway with this whole Amber thing, too was this was very much a winnable case for her. This was Amber's trial to lose. She didn't need to prove that he abused her. She just needed to prove she didn't write the op-ed about him. She probably could have rested on plausible deniability and just skate by with a clean win, but like obviously her ego wouldn't let that happen. It wasn't enough that she took millions from this guy and abused him, defamed him. She needed vindication. She wanted, she wanted to be back in the gracious arms of current day female empowerment. I mean, you can see why. It's, it's lucrative as all hell. I mean, if you're a female movie star right now, it is Hollywood's go-to to gender swap an established franchise with a female lead. I mean, she probably, you know, since this trial, she probably would have taken another movie. She'd probably be asking for six, maybe eight million, so... It, you know, it makes sense that her image was more important than actually winning the trial. I mean, she didn't just lose millions on the trial. She lost tens of millions over the course of um, over the course of her career with endorsement deals, overseas work, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars were lost on her deciding to testify in this trial because people hate her. No studio in the right mind would hire her now. I hadn't seen somebody so universally hated it until Daryl Brooks came along. And he fucking murdered six people. <laughs> That's crazy to me that they, they really aren't that far apart when it comes to, like, public outcry and, and hate. It's basically why I wanted to make this video. And my head was bashing against the back of the bar and I couldn't breathe. And I remember trying to get up and I was slipping on the glass. My feet were slipping. My arms were slipping on the countertops. And I remember just trying to get up so I could breathe, so I could tell him that he was really hurting me. I didn't think he knew what he was doing. I don't know how. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sorry. I, mean, I couldn't breathe. Yeah, yeah, you you said that. Please. I don't know. Please, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. What the fuck? Man, she 
she's making some weird faces. I couldn't... I couldn't breathe. I couldn't get through to him. I couldn't... I couldn't get up. I couldn't get up. <laughs> this is brutal. <laughs> and I don't know how that ended. I don't know. I don't know how. I don't know what happened next. I don't understand. You don't know what happened next? This is like sending my bullshit meter into the red. Like, I, I was kind of on the fence on the other clip, but holy shit. You don't know what happened next? I remember every time where I was, what happened next, every time I got hit by my girlfriend when she abused me. Every single time. And there was a lot, I hate to admit. Again, this just doesn't make sense. A lot of this, like... I, I, you, what sends it even further for me, she says, I don't want to do this. If you've been abused, if you've genuinely been abused, you want to tell everybody. You want people to know as much as fucking possible that they're this disgusting human being. You have no problem going up there and telling every fucking detail. Her story keeps changing, too. Like, what the fuck? It's so strange. <laughs> what are you wiping? There's no tears. I, I when I... The, the next thing I remember... I was bent over, um, backwards on the bar, meaning my chest was up. Bent over, but her chest was up? I was staring at the blue lights. And she said she was face up before, but Jenny bent her over. On this, my back was on the countertops. Jesus, she's getting all mixed up. She can't even keep her story and straight. I thought he was punching me. I thought he was... I'm sorry. Oh, man. <laughs> She's like, make it stop. Ask me a question, please. He was, he was, <laughs> Can't keep making up all these I details. This pressure, I felt this pressure. He on my pubic bone. Oh, okay, okay, I okay, okay. I don't know if she is lying or not, but I just feel uncomfortable commenting on that subject. Uh, I think there's that doesn't more of that doesn't need to be out on YouTube. Um, all right, so. Let's take a look at Dora Brooks now. Decision? You that can. I accept it for value in return for and value. And that's what... Okay, I know we're like three seconds in and I'm already stopping, but I have to talk about this accept it for value, return for value thing, because it is hilarious. Now, it's a bit of a rabbit hole, so buckle up. When Daryl says accept it for value, return for value, he's basically referencing, like, Basic sovereign citizen beliefs. This is like their go-to number one. It's based on straw man theory. Straw man theory is the belief that every person has two identities. The quote-unquote real flesh and blood man who lives on the land and then the straw man. You might remember Daryl taking issue with his name being in all capital letters. He's not making an argument for grammar but rather, sovereign citizens believe that when their name is written on all caps, that's their business identity, i.e. the straw man, the one who holds the account. Back in Great Depression days, sovereign citizens believed that the U.S. Treasury took out liens against every person based on their birth certificate. They legit believe there's a secret division of the U.S. Treasury where every living individual has an account ranging from anywhere between 600,000 to 20 million. I swear to God, I'm not making this up. They legit believe there's a secret division of the U.S. Treasury, and for every living person on Earth, there's $20 million in there that you can just access by writing your name in all capital letters and accepting for value and returning for value a document. And yes, that would include the quote-unquote charging instruments for the murders Daryl's accused of. This is why we're, we hear Daryl constantly ask, who, who files the claim? He's basically asserting that he can access this secret, secret account in the U.S. Treasury to pay off the murders. That's why 
when he's showing up for sentencing and he, he actually acknowledges that that's his name, he asks for a rendering, a rendering of the account as if he's going to just pull $20 million out of this account pay all of the families off of the people he killed and just walk out of their walk out of their free cuz they're filing a claim against the straw man version of Daryl Brooks the one who holds an account in the secret division of the US Treasury I I am not making this up long story short Daryl doesn't believe any of this he's citing these old sovsit tactics because it's the number one agenda of a sovsit to delay proceedings, waste government resources, tie up the court system as much as possible by specifically citing frivolous yet long-winded legal arguments and filing just dozens of very detailed yet nonsensical paperwork. They refer to it as, as paper terrorism. Those motivations very much line up with Daryl's motivations. The longer he disrupts and, dis and delays the court, the longer he gets to put on his little monkey suit and play lawyer, being on camera, forcing his victims, who in his mind are falsely persecuting him anyways, to relive his attacks all over and over again. All eyes are on him. He's just a star of his own little lawyer show. He physically cannot stop himself from interrupting the proceedings at every chance he gets because he is so obsessed with being in the center of attention. Good, bad, or indifferent. He doesn't care what kind of attention it is, as long as he's getting it. That's how I'm going to answer that. So it's let's not verify um, proof. We still, we still aren't. Sir, there is no requirement in the law that the state or the court establish that. So actually, your there is. Noted. Actually, there is, Your Honor. Subject matter jurisdiction Sir, has to please. be proven for the record. Has it to be not. proven. Has to be proven. You know that just as well as Mr. Brooks. You know that. Please do not make statements that mischaracterize the law. You know it has to be proven. Or that impugn the, the integrity of this you court. You know it has to be proven and the on the record. Proceedings here. You know the it jury has to is be proven. advised to disregard the statements that Mr. Brooks is making regarding subject matter jurisdiction. They are not evidence, and you are to disregard them. They're not presented as evidence. Just has yet to be proven for the record. The jury will disregard the incorrect statements of the law that Mr. Brooks is stating. Where's lawful law that is incorrect? Mr. Brooks, please. I am going to read one instruction. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The defendant will now make an opening statement. The purpose of an opening statement is to give the defendant an opportunity to tell you what he expects the evidence will show so that you will better understand the evidence as it is introduced during the trial. I must caution you, however, that the opening statements are not evidence. With that, go ahead, sir. Um, obviously, I don't have any uh, rehearsed or well-prepared well speech, so I'm just gonna speak from the heart. Oh, obviously. Why would Daryl do such things as prepare or make sense, or have a defense. No, no, good idea, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Incoherent ramblings from the heart are a much better plan. Um, I would just like to first say that uh, I want to bring to remembrance something I, I think everyone in this room has been taught uh, pretty much as far back as we can remember is that there's always two sides to every story. Um, and for so long now, uh, roughly a year, there's only truly been one side told of this story. And uh, I've sat back and watched um, from countless narratives that, that, that's been put out there. Um, the way this incident has been portrayed at times. And uh, finally, uh, everyone getting a chance to 
get the full story. Um, you won't hear me try to uh, argue facts. You mean like the fact that your name is Daryl Brooks? Um, the fact is that this incident was tragic. Very tragic. That's not lost on me. Um, facts are that There's still a lot of people healing, um, a lot of families healing on both sides. Oh my God, I hate people that say this. He has taken no accountability. He's shown zero remorse for his crimes, but now we're supposed to feel sorry for him and his family? It's like when a celebrity gets canceled on Twitter and the first thing they say is, oh, well, I've been getting death threats, as if that somehow negates whatever shitty thing they did. Like, whose fault is it you're getting those death threats in the first place? God. Um, and when I'm confident that uh, the evidence will show, um, sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. I am so glad he takes a moment throughout this trial to stop and tell everyone when he is getting emotional. Otherwise, we would have just assumed he's some sort of black-hearted man-demon who is void of any real emotion and is incapable of feeling remorse for the dozens of people he killed or maimed, or even showing the smallest amount of respect or decency to any other living thing on this planet. Thank God. When I'm confident that the evidence will show. is that this incident was not planned. This incident was not intentional. And this incident was never even thought about. It's easy to I'm sorry. Give me a second. Uh. <sighs> Think is a. Uh, It's easy to look at the magnitude of something like this and form opinions. I think uh, it's easy to disregard a lot of a lot of factors. And I think uh, in reference to what I stated earlier, it's, it's easy to forget the other side of the coin. It, there's been a, a lot of suffering involved in this incident, a lot. Obviously, um, with the families, <laughs> with, the, with the community. In uh, 
even the alleged, the alleged defendant's uh, family as well. There's, there's been a lot of suffering. Again, I am just so, so grateful that he takes this time to remind us who we all should be truly feeling sorry for, who the real victims are. Daryl Brooks! And Daryl Brooks' family! And his third-party interviewer. A lot of misunderstanding. And, uh... I just want you to keep in mind, uh, everything that will be uh, presented in its totality, keep in mind. The power that you have. In the literary world, they call this foreshadowing. I believe uh, that should escape your, your knowledge. You know, this is this has been a long process for, for everybody. If you had to take a guess as to Whose fault that was? Who's, whose fault do you think that would be? Just just take a stab in the dark. Not, not a literal stab. And what I believe is, uh, when it's time for you to make your decision, all of you, believed it and I pray that it's the right decision this is the best he comes up with just just do it's right he says the same thing in the closing argument it's so bad he really thinks this is like his to kill a mockingbird moment and he's just gonna expose the county and their systemic racism that he's just a Misunderstood and falsely accused vagabond with a heart of gold. <laughs> that all the factors are weighed. been a lot of words thrown out there about the alleged a lot of speculation a lot of ridicule Words like demon, words like monster, words like moron, words like asshole. I know uh, a lot of the time I've been before you, you've you seen me with this mask on. <coughs> I've had my reasons for that. But I feel 
now is the time to. It's important that you see before who I am. Lip sucking and baked bean teeth and all, baby. No mask. For who I am. I think this is the moment for that. Right at your uh, your eyes and ears remain as open as possible. I understand that you alone decide this case, this matter. power is in your hands, all of you. To determine for yourselves <coughs> what truth is. I have no idea what truth is. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, well, there you have it. That's pretty much it. He actually isn't that bad of an actor. I mean, he's he's better than Amber, not that that's saying all that much. Um, he's a good public speaker, too. I mean, I remember giving presentations at school, and I was not nearly as good as this. Especially if he truly didn't memorize this beforehand. That's kind of impressive. It did, I, I can't do that on the fly like that. I mean, I, I can't deny it. it's somewhat impressive, albeit deceitful. He at least was able to produce real tears, too. Again, we can't say that for Amber. One thing I did notice they both do is after they're done, quote-unquote, crying, they, like, scrape the inside of their nose with their fingers, like, through a tissue. It looks like Daryl's doing it behind his Bible, or at least he was a second ago. Okay, so here's a better clip. You'll see what I mean. See? He is going in. So bizarre. All right, have a seat, please. And disgusting. Did time both closings? You have thirteen twenty-eight left. Ugh. Ugh. So I have a theory. I'm pretty sure, and I've heard this before, that if you put Vicks vapor rub inside your nostrils, it makes like your eyes tear up. Like it makes your eyes water. I think that's what both of these two are doing. It doesn't make you cry. It makes it so forcing yourself to cry is easier. Here we go. Pay attention. She's going to do it. See? Subtle, but it was there. Now check this one out. See? <laughs> She's fucking digging for gold up there. Going to hit her brain. <laughs> so I think we can safely say those are definitely good examples of Crocodile Tears, which was the subject of today's video. I do think there is more to examine between these two. They're both deceitful and manipulative. They both abuse their partners. They both damage their own defense in pursuit of vindication. I think there's probably at least one more video in this series comparing the two. If you guys like it, please let me know in the comments. I have to take a minute and say I have loved reading the comments. You guys are so nice. It's been just overwhelming. The I, I didn't expect at all making YouTube videos to be what it has. And, and the outpouring of feedback has just positive feedback, mind you. A very, very... I don't think I've gotten one mean comment. It's just been so awesome. You guys are fucking cool. So um, we're just going to take the last few minutes of this video. And um, I'd like to... 
look and respond to a few of my favorite comments from the last video, so let's do that right now. Amanda Page writes, I agree that the torture of Erica is the most disturbing and disgusting behavior of the whole trial. Thankfully, Zach and Judge Darrow stepped in and gave her some protection, but he nonetheless got to have one last hurrah at her expense. I hope she can get the help she needs to live the rest of her life with her children in happiness and peace. Great review. Thank you so much. Amanda, you are so sweet. I've seen a couple of your other comments. I really appreciate the feedback. Um, I'm going to show the next comment that responds to the whole Erica thing, but I totally agree that I really, really hope that she's able to move on to a great thing. But let's look at the next comment to see maybe uh, an update on Erica. Faye O'Brien writes, I talk to Erica every day, and yes, she did want to scream when he was lying like that. Trust me, I asked. She's referring to the photos when Erica was still on the stand. She had just basically sit there and be silent. I, uh, I had said in the video that it must have been really hard to, for her to keep from just yelling out, "Those aren't from me. I haven't talked to him." Uh, her next comment says, "Yes, he knew Erica was a child. Her family literally told him constantly leave her alone." Because she was too young and he refused to do so. That's why they don't like him to this day. Uh, she's referring to Erica being 15 and him being an SO. Um, I'm sure they have a lot of reasons for not liking Daryl Brooks. But I, I'm pretty sure that's probably at the top of the list. In the reply to that last comment, Faye O'Brien again says, I'm going to tell her about your channel so that she can start watching. She likes to hear y'all's point of view. I may be able to talk her into an interview if you'd like to do that one day. As a matter of fact, let me try to locate your link so I can send it to her. And then she says, done. That would be epic. Faye, you are officially my favorite subscriber. If you could get an interview with er Erica, that would be so sick. I would love to do that. It would be huge for my channel. I think uh, this family does everything. Did an interview with her. And I know I would seen another guy on YouTube who did one. Um, I watch a lot of Daryl Brooks content. J9 Eve is another favorite of mine. If you guys don't watch her, check her out. But um, Faye, thank you again um, for doing that for me. Please let me know if she says anything. I, I appreciate you. All right, I'm going to read one more. Um, this one is actually, this isn't from my channel. This was a comment I found on the first Amber Heard testimony video. We're just talking about the first time Johnny Depp hit her, and I just thought it was so poignant, and I, I, I felt it was worth sharing. I worked for an abuse hotline for four years and dealt with hundreds of abuse calls and stories. I have attended numerous fundraising functions that oppose abuse and have listened to countless stories drudged up, and, re and relived. And lastly, I was raised in an abusive household my father beat the ever-living shit out of my mother and abused me physically and emotionally as well. Those situations and emotions are engraved in my mind, and the emotion that comes with telling and reliving your abuse goes a certain way that is hard to fake. Having said all that, I don't believe a single word this woman says. <laughs> Very true, damned Ash. I'm going to have to send this person a message. Um, but yeah, I, I had the same the same feeling when I saw that. Um, it just it didn't ring true for me at all, in the least. It didn't feel real. didn't feel genuine. I feel like if you've gone through this, you kind of know what it looks like and what it sounds like. And for me... Amber, she more feels like she's telling the narrative from a Lifetime movie or practicing for her Emmy. <laughs> so, I don't know. My two cents, take it for what it's worth. All right, guys. Well, that's going to pretty much do it for this video. Um, again, I'm loving making these. Uh, you guys are awesome. I love talking to you guys in the comments, so please, please, please leave a, leave a comment. I'm going to do the tacky YouTuber thing, and um, if you do feel like you enjoyed this video, I work really hard on these. This one took me forever, so if you feel like I've earned a subscription, that would really mean a lot to me, but if not, you know, that's your prerogative. I want you guys to have a great week. 
Have a great life. Take care of those who love you, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye now.